readership loyalty. You know, people read it, were concerned, involved in it, and so on, but it was a working class newspaper. And it simply could not compete in the capital markets, couldn't get advertising, couldn't amass capital, and it finally went under. Uh, in the United States, that happened earlier. This is more of a business run society. So much earlier, the independent community and working class press pretty much disappeared. Although not, you know, it's not that far back. I mean, uh, even in the 1950s, there were still about uh, 800 labor newspapers that reached about 20 or 30 million people. Um, then that's disappeared. By now we only have corporate media. Uh, and once you have only corporate media, the range of opinion and attitude and so on is gonna be pretty narrow. Uh, it gets even narrower if you have consolidation. But the big effect, I think, is prior to consolidation, if you look, look at it. Excellent. Mine's actually a follow-up to that. Um, I was wondering, what do you think, um, as far as potential creators, distributors, or more importantly, um, consumers of media, what do you think we could do to dissuade the the mix from happening. Well, you can do a lot. So, I mean, with all the consolidation and the controls and, you know, corporate ownership and so on, there's plenty of opportunities. And in fact, they're not used. Like take Boston, where we live. Uh, a lot of people here, y young activists, are very much concerned and rightly concerned over these questions of media consolidation, corporate media propaganda, and so on and so forth. You know, how rotten the Boston Globe is and the whole story. Uh, on the other hand, they're not using resources that are right in front of their eyes. Like every town in Boston, and in fact around the country, uh, has a uh, cable station, community cable station. Uh, it, they're there because when the laws were passed, I don't know, 30 years ago, granting cable monopolies, uh, Congress stuck something in requiring the cable company that got a monopoly in some area to uh, establish uh, community-based public access uh, television. Well, you go down to, the, say, the Cambridge Station. I mean, it's not CBS, but by international standards, I mean, people would die for it in most of the world. And it's there. You can get to it. You can use it. They don't really have much in the way of controls. It's more or less available than anybody wants to use it. Almost nobody's using it for any sensible purpose. Um, there are a few towns where they're being used, but not much. Uh, well, that's an opportunity that's sitting right there. And there are plenty of others. I mean, you, we should learn something from what people do under conditions of real repression and harsh conditions, like take, say, Brazil, which is a much more lively democratic culture than we do, far more. And we can learn a lot from it. Uh, just about six years ago, I was in Brazil uh, actually traveling around with Lula, the guy who's now president. And uh, one thing he took me to was a suburb of Rio de Janeiro. The suburbs in Brazil are kind of like Europe. The suburbs are the poor areas. The rich people live inside, you know, it's inverted from the US. Uh, so we went out to some poor working class suburb of a couple of million people, fairly miserable. And it's a s sort of semi-tropical country, so a lot of people are outside. You know, there's public squares and people milling around in the evening and so on. Well, there was a project, that's what we went to see, a small NGO, a couple of people, a couple of professionals, professional media people, uh, had tried to establish community-based television in the poor suburbs. And the way they did it was almost pennies. They had a truck, uh, which had a big screen on the, that you could stick up on the roof and some sound equipment and so on. And they, by the time we were there, they had there had been enough organization in the community, so they went out to a public square in one of these communities, and uh, at prime TV time, like nine o'clock, uh, they were broadcasting in the public square uh, programs, acted, produced, written by people in the community. You know, poor people, little education, and they were. You know, I, I don't understand Portuguese, but I could follow it enough to sort of see what was going on and was explained to me. It was a mixture of uh, entertainment, you know, clown or something like that, and very serious skits. 
about racism, about uh, the debt, you know, all kinds of things that people care about. And they were all intermingled. Uh, one of the young actresses, looked about 17, who was on screen was also walking around. There's a big mass of people there, you know, families and so on, hundreds of people milling around. Uh, she was walking around the crowd with a microphone uh, asking people to comment on what they had just seen. And they were filmed, so you saw them commenting on it, and then somebody sitting in a bar somewhere would say he wanted to comment and you'd fill him, film him and so on. And there was a real, lively, ongoing public community television reaching a large number of people right in prime time uh, for pennies, you know. I mean, they can do it in Brazil, and we can't do it here. You know, that doesn't make sense. You know. uh, we could do way more than that. Uh, and the, the technology is available. I mean, you know a lot more about it than I do, I'm sure, but there's the technology is available. Uh, there are all sorts of means of uh, reaching people from you know, everything from the internet to cable television to desktop printing to all sorts of stuff, which is by now pretty cheap and easily usable. And it could create uh, alternative media, uh, which would overwhelm the major media, which people tend not to trust anyway. You know, trust in the media is way down, rightly, uh, but people don't have an alternative, and alternatives are potentially there. Uh, it takes talent and energy and commitment to use them, but uh, you know, you're not going to face what people face in Brazil, extreme poverty, repressive security forces, and so on. We don't have any of those problems. So yeah, there's a lot of things that could be done. Question real quick. Um, I know you were saying you didn't uh, really focus too much on music, but I was wondering if you think maybe music could be effective in dissuading consolidation. Do you think that could be an effective tool? Uh, I'm way out of my depth here, I should say. You know, my musical uh, experiences uh, are sort of from the 1940s and before. But uh, there's no doubt, you know, you, you guys know this way better than I do, but the music, the young youth music cultures are very politically alive. I mean, I know this j even from my own peripheral experience. Actually, during, during the first Iraq war, I was approached by a punk rock group called uh, Bad Religion. I don't know, maybe you know who it is. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> and they said, would I mind uh, talking for eight minutes about the Iraq war? Okay, so they, they sent me a tape recorder and you know, I talked for eight minutes on the tape recorder. And then I, a little while later, I got a record you know, I think a 40, 45 probably, or whatever they used in, which on one side had a, something called a song. Don't ask me, but it was called a song. <laughs> and I was told it was an anti-war song. And the other side was my eight minutes. Actually, I sent the record to a friend who had a 14-year-old daughter and asked her if she could decode the song for me. <laughs> and she wrote me a very erudite analysis of what the song was. And its political content and everything else. Uh, well, you know, that record, I, I had more outreach around the world than any book I've ever written. I mean, everywhere I was in the United States or abroad, I was getting asked by people to sign, young people to sign the record. So, it, and uh, I'm told that that's not unusual, that there are, um, I don't want to, you know, I'm telling you things you know much better than I do, but. So you can confirm it if it's true or correct it if it's wrong. But what I'm told is that uh, among young people around the world, in fact, this is uh, a source of uh, a lot of inspiration, you know, creativity, activism, uh, education, and so on. And if it is, yeah, you should have every reason to foster it. Given that, or you know, thinking of that, what's important in looking um, into the election? Like, what factors do you think are important to consider? Well, first of all, it's all reversible. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of 
privilege and freedom uh, just incomparable. Nobody, there's nothing in the world like it. The question is, do we want to use it? Uh, I mean, even with this administration in office, everything is reversible. I mean, they can act to a certain extent. They cannot uh, counteract organized, active public opinion. I mean, you can't even do that in a dictatorship. Uh, it's uh, almost impossible in a more free society. That's why there's so much propaganda to try to prevent people from using the power that they have, either by marginalizing them or isolating them or making them passive consumers or making them feel hopeless or whatever. A uh, huge amount of effort goes into that. You know, like probably a trillion dollars a year goes into marketing, uh, which is mostly just attitude control. You know, try to make people passive uh, you know, consumers who don't do anything. Uh, but they don't have to agree to that. You know, you can change it. Uh, again, Brazil is a striking case. It's, you know, here's a dramatic case right in the hemisphere. It's a real lesson in democracy. Lula, who I mentioned, uh, was just elected president. I mean, that's inconceivable in the United States that a popular figure coming out and there, a poor peasant coming out of the lab, you know, a labor organizer, uh, would be able to be elected president, push, pl put in power by massive popular movements, which were able to overcome, first of all, severe repression, also concentration of capital, concentration of media that goes way beyond anything we have here. But over decades, they were able to develop a kind of a democratic culture which made that possible. Uh, you know, if you could do it in Brazil in 20 years under those conditions, we would have been able to do it here in two years under easy conditions. Uh, and it would affect whoever is, is up there saying, I'm your leader. And you could get better candidates too, at every level, you know, from local representatives up to uh, president. Uh, it's all available, you know, and there isn't anything much that can be done to stop it. I mean, the means of controlling people by violence have mostly disappeared in countries like the United States. In fact, if you look at the history of propaganda, some good histories of it, uh, you'll see that, you'll notice that propaganda really developed uh, most uh, massively in the more free societies, like the public relations industry, which is essentially a huge propaganda agency, uh, developed in uh, England and the United States, the most free societies around, around a century ago. And if you look back at the records, it was developing precisely out of a very conscious understanding on the part of uh, privileged sectors, elites, that they were losing the capacity to control the population by force. You know, just people had won too much freedom. They wouldn't sub submit to force, and you couldn't do it. Uh, so therefore, you had to control uh, attitudes and opinions. And the way you do that is in part by indoctrination and the school system and you know, the news and that sort of thing. But in large part, the way of controlling opinions and attitudes was understood right away to be inducing hopelessness, making people feel helpless and isolated, separate them from one another, make sure they don't interact. I'm um, like the ideal society would be based on dyads, you know, you and the tube but no further interaction among people because that's dangerous. Uh, and a lot of uh, what's been going on over the last century and is going on right at this moment is about that. Let's take the Medicare business in Congress. What's it about? I mean, you know, any rational analyst, this article in the Boston Globe this morning, but everyone in the health care business knows perfectly well that we have an extremely inefficient health care system. It's far more costly than anywhere else in the world. It has huge bureaucratic costs. It imposes all sorts of administrative burdens and so on. And the health outcomes are not that good, you know? Not, not nowhere near the highest in the industrial world. Uh, and now they're gonna try to make it worse by uh, introducing, you know, one of the core elements of the current bill is what they call competition between publicly subsidized private health plans and the national health plan. And the idea of that is to try to ensure that the insurance companies and so on will be able to cherry pick, they'll be able to pull off the healthy people, insure them, 
prices for everyone else will go up. You'll be driven off the public system. Well, that's part of the effort to destroy the public system, like destroying Social Security and schools, for that matter, or any of these things. Well, why, why such a tremendous effort to destroy them? Because it is understood. I mean, it's, it's, there's no economic motive for it. In fact, the economic motives are the opposite. But it is understood that things like Medicare, Social Security, schools, other such things are based on an unacceptable principle that has to be driven out of people's minds. It's the principle that you're supposed to care about somebody else, okay? That you're supposed to care, as a member of a democratic community, you're supposed to care whether the widow on the other side of town starves. And you've got to drive that out of people's heads uh, because if people have those ideas, they might act on them. And if they act on them, they're going to dismantle the whole system of domination and control. So those ideas have to be driven out of people's heads. They have to be made to believe that their entire worth depends on their own consumption of useless commodities. And that's driven into kids' heads from infancy. I mean, I watch television with my grandchildren. You know, you watch the two-year-old kids just getting this stuff driven into their heads. In fact, there's even a subject in applied psychology now uh, on uh, what's actually called nagging. There's an analysis of, there's been a huge problem for the advertising industry of how to get young kids who don't have money to be consumers. Uh, young children are called potential consumers, not children. So how do you get them to use that potential? Well, the only way they can use it is by getting their parents to buy things. So there's a study of nagging, the different kinds of ways in which children can nag their parents. You know, apparently there's half a dozen different varieties of nagging, and you can cultivate those, and they'll drive their parents crazy, and their parents will buy them, you know, some $500 toy that they'll throw away tomorrow, you know. That's crucial. I mean, that's the way you turn people into automata. You control them. Uh, separate them from one another, drive any human instinct out of their heads, uh, make them see themselves as you know, nothing in life except uh, adding to my useless commodities. Uh, and I don't care about anybody else because you're not supposed to care. Uh, if, if you can get to that point, then you really have people under control. You don't need security forces. And that has been a major effort for the past century. It gets more and more sophisticated, more and more money goes into it all the time. Uh, those are techniques of control, but you don't have to submit to them. You know, they're very fragile systems. I mean, if people are unwilling to submit to them, they just go away, you know? It's not like, uh, the, se it's not like the security forces in a totalitarian state who don't go away. You know, they go away. They're just, they persist only because people subordinate themselves to them, which means that there's a lot of opportunity and hope for change, but it's going to take some effort. Okay. My question uh, actually goes back to corporate media. Uh, about two days ago, the Wash um, New York Times ran an article in which uh, the FBI sent out a memo to mostly to most law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. on how to deal with protesters. Um, what what, I, what my question to you is is sort of to sort of reflect upon where do you think how far do you think the government's going to go along with the media to sort of smother this opposition to mm -hmm. the war and to any any time anyone sort of doesn't go with the yeah. natural flow of the government how far do you think they yeah. go and how yeah, I understand yeah um, it's a bad thing but we shouldn't exaggerate. Uh, as compared with almost anyone else in the world, uh, we're facing a paper tiger. The FBI is the national political police, okay? It was established to be a political police. It was established by Woodrow Wilson uh, during the, what was called the Red Scare, which was far worse than any repression that's happened since. It was very serious. They devastated the labor movement. They kicked thousands of people out of the country. I mean, the leading, well, you mentioned Eugene, was it you who mentioned Eugene Debs? Somebody, did, I heard somebody mention his name. Yeah, nobody, anyway. Uh, Eugene Debs, who was the leading figure in the American labor movement ever, in fact, 
and uh, you know, presidential candidate and so on. He was tossed into jail by Wilson during this uh, because he raised critical questions about the war. You weren't allowed to do that. Uh, that's the time when the FBI was formed, and that's been their role. I mean, they also look after car thefts and stuff, but this has been the primary role. Uh, through, uh, and th they're just a national political police. I mean, if you haven't read about it, you should read about COINTEL Pro. In fact, if we valued our freedom, that would be taught in elementary school. Uh, the COINTEL Pro, which was exposed around the same time as Watergate, was a long program by the National Political Police going back through the Eisenhower, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, and Nixon administrations to a, a subversive program of the National Political Police to undermine every popular movement. You know, it started with uh, the b all the black movements, uh, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, everything, and it was no joke. It went up to the level of political assassination. You know, it wasn't a joke. One of the leading uh, uh, black organizers, Fred Hampton, was just murdered in a Gestapo-style assassination set up by the FBI and they used the Chicago police to do it. All this stuff was exposed around the same time as Watergate. I mean, in comparison, Watergate was a tea party. You know, it didn't even exist. You know? uh, the, but this just disappeared and Watergate became a huge issue. Simple reason. Uh, Watergate, which was very minor, nothing much happened, uh, they went after people with power. You don't do that. People with power will kill you. you know? So you go after, say, the Democratic Party, which is half of the wealth and power in the country. You know, you're not going to get away with it. On the other hand, if you murder Fred Hampton, that's okay. Nobody cares about that. The civil libertarians don't even notice it. Uh, uh, and the same is true across the board. But COINTELPRO was a very serious program. Actually, you know, I should, and, and there's nothing like it now as far as we know. I mean, there are disruptive attempts, but they're not like that. Uh, I, the anti-war movement back in the 60s, those of you who are, say, my age, or younger, in fact, will remember, uh, we didn't know the details about COINTELPRO, but you knew it was going on. So I, I was personally active in resistance groups, and every group, whether it was resistance or you know civil disobedience or just plain organizing demonstrations, every group that was at all sophisticated took for granted that there were FBI infiltrators in the group. And you can usually even pick them out. You know, if some guy is, uh, you know, dressed like a, sort of a movie version of a hippie and is shouting uh, off the cops and so on, uh, you can be pretty sure that he's going to show up as a government uh, uh, informant in the next trial. So people kind of identified them and kept away from them and so on. Uh, but we did, uh, if we were doing something serious, like helping deserters get out of the country, uh, we'd always do it in affinity groups where you knew the people. Uh, because you just knew that no matter how close the group was, probably infiltrated. And you take that for granted, you know, telephone, internet, and so on, and you just go around it. But the fact of the matter is, it is a very fragile system. You know, as compared with other places in the world, we're w very well off. I, I mean, you're not well off if you're a black organizer in the ghetto, say Fred Hampton. But for people who have any kind of share and privilege, and that's a huge number of people in a country as rich as this, they're pretty well protected. Uh, and that means, yeah, you keep your eye on it, but uh, not exaggerate. I mean, in, say, Colombia, which I mentioned, uh, people doing what we're doing uh, would be facing the threat, a serious threat of assassination. I mean, about 20 political assassinations a day. You know, we're not worried about that. If you go to, say, Turkey, uh, which is quite different. The intellectual classes are very different from here or anywhere in the West, and very impressive. I mean, you go to Turkey, which is a pretty repressive state, uh, leading writers, uh, musicians, artists, uh, you know, academics, journalists, are not only protesting constantly against the harsh laws, but they're carrying out regular civil disobedience, regular civil disobedience and facing serious penalties. It's not fun to be in a Turkish jail. But they do it all the time, unpretentiously. You know, I've been there. They don't make a fuss about it. I've even joined in some. They just do it regularly. That's what you do. Uh, and the penalties are far harsher than anything that we can dream about. 
So yeah, all of these things are right and we should be concerned about them, but you know, by the scale of what has happened in the past or what happens elsewhere, it's uh, not a huge problem. You know, and then bad, you should stop it, but shouldn't deter anyone. Thank you, Noam Chomsky, for coming to speak to us. Thank you for coming.